Oh, let's stare at the pot this morning. It's a gorgeous day. I'm so excited. The weather has been phenomenal. Got a little sun on my cheeks, and uh, it's just been really, really nice. Um, if you didn't know, we've, we are having a deacon ordination this evening. Uh, ordination will be at 5 o'clock here, and then a meal to follow. So if you'd like to come and support that, I think it would be a huge, huge blessing to be here, part of that tonight. But it'll be tonight from 5 and 6. It does say open gym tonight. I've already told the youth no open gym. Um, so um, we'll be doing that tonight. Next Sunday, next Sunday is uh, gradu- Graduating Senior Sunday. We have um, three high schoolers and two uh, um, college graduates. And if you know of someone, I do not want to leave anyone out. So if you know of someone that's, that, uh, that is off the radar or maybe, maybe uh, off the radar, let me know. I want to make sure everyone is included, uh, but it will be after the morning service. See, last year, last couple of years with COVID, we were kind of skittish. We weren't sure, and it was kind of back and forth. And uh, I know historically we've done it on Sunday nights, which is not, not as really a thing this, now. So what we're going to do next Sunday, after the AM service, we're going to, whoever can stay, just come over to the fellowship hall. We're going to have a church-wide meal uh, and have a slideshow and hand out Bibles uh, and just uh, encourage, encourage, encourage our students. There'll be some neat little things that you can do. There'll be a few yard signs if you'd like to sign, write a little, little, little ditty, uh, uh, give them a card, whatnot. Um, that's, that's coming up next Sunday. And that's a little early, but with Mother's Day around the corner, we try to kind of get a jump on that because it starts going really fast. This time of year, we have proms and all kinds of things going on, so we were trying to stay ahead of that curve. That's next Sunday, May the 1st. Put that on your calendars. Also, the church council will be meeting uh, in the youth room. It says May 1st uh, that evening. Um, The Dominican Republic information will also be meeting uh, May 1st. A lot going on. If you're interested in going Uh, On that mission trip, uh, please see Devin, and we'll be meeting that day to get any, even if you think you might be interested, be a good time to kind of come and get information, kind of know what's going on. Uh, May 8th is Mother's Day, and we'll be having muffins with mothers. Last year, I think we said four mothers, and people didn't know whether they should come or not. No, no, this is with, it's everyone to come. We'll have muffins for everyone in the fellowship hall. Uh, should be some good, clean fun. I think everybody enjoys that. Just we laugh. And also, I have pictures from last year. Uh, if, if you gave me your picture of you and your mom last year, I should still have that. If I don't have a picture of you and your mother or you're not sure, feel free to drop that by the uh, church office or email that or text that to me and, uh, or just hand it to me. We'll, we'll get it up somehow. So uh, it's nice to roll through some of the older pictures. And I've got some of you little bitty babies with a mom. Uh, and now you're a grandma, right? But it's, uh, it's, it's just sweet time that we get to do that ne- uh, the uh, May 8th. Uh, and don't forget that Annie Armstrong, our offering uh, goal was $2,300. We're at $2,005. We're $295 away from that. That's wonderful. But if you'd like to contribute, that's still available. If you are a guest with us or a guest, maybe first time in a long time, we are so glad you're here. Uh, we're going to open a word of, word of prayer. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for the love that you give us. God, I thank you for the beautiful sunshine and the warm weather and just a reminder of your presence. Father, we thank you for Easter and all that it meant to us. And Father, and, and for today as Brother Corey brings the, the message, uh, Father, how important it was that, that you ascended to the Father and how, how powerful that word is. Father, may we be listening with attentive hearts. Father, we lift up those in our church family that are traveling today that are sick today and are watching a uh, live stream. Father, we ask that you just encourage us all as we lean into you this morning. May you uh, just speak to our hearts and maybe be listening to your word. We love you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Uh, last week was Easter. We talked about the, resur- uh, the resurrection of Jesus. And this week, Brother Corey is going to be preaching on the ascension I wanted to read a couple verses out of Romans. It's Romans chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. It says, Now if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his Spirit who lives in you. 
So this morning, we're going to sing about the power that is in the blood of Jesus because the power that's in the blood is the same power that the Spirit gives us that rose Jesus from the dead and his authority was shown when he ascended, uh, which Corey's going to talk about today. So stand with me this morning as we sing about the power. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of to praise God for this morning. Enjoyed Easter Sunday last week. What a, a wonderful reminder, right, that Jesus rose from the dead. I always love this time of year with spring. 
kind of reminds us of the same fact. And of course, uh, today I'm going to preach on the ascension of Jesus. I'm excited about that. In all the years I've preached, I've never had a, uh, a message that I devoted exclusively to the ascension of Christ. So I look forward to that in a few moments. Uh, don't forget tonight, come back at 5 o'clock to support Darren and Donnie as we ordain two uh, new deacons. And then we'll do what all good Baptists do. We'll have a potluck meal afterwards, okay? So... Uh, uh, be here for that uh, tonight at 5 and at 6. Well, let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you this morning. Thank you for your goodness and your grace. Lord, thank you for the hope that we have, Father, because you overcame death, hell, and the grave. You rose again on the third day just like you said you would. And Lord, after appearing to many people over a period of 40 days, you ascended to heaven and you said you will be back. And Lord, we long for your return. Have your way. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Stand again with me this morning as we continue in worship through song. Man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own. has been on Jesus silence as he stood accused beaten mocked and scorned bowing to the Father's will he took a crown that rugged cross my salvation where your love poured out over me and now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor unto thee saints of heaven God's own
Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Good morning. Hi. Hi. I brought something today. I wore this this week. I'm going to let you guess what I did. Hi. Hi. What's that? What, what was I doing? It was me. What? Why, why did I? Why, why did I wear this? Oh, that's dangerous. You need a microphone. Yes. Dear, oh, you're close. I was hunting. Oh, so I was hunting. You're, that's right. Uh, this wrong season, but I was I was actually turkey hunting, and um, so. So it's, it's really important when you go turkey hunting to get all camouflaged up. Like you're supposed to like cover your hands. And matter of fact, a lot of the guys will even paint up their face and, and wear all kinds of camouflage. And because why would I wear camouflage? What am I trying to look like? Uh, no, I want to not look like me. What do I need to look like? I'm going to try to look like the trees. And if I look like a tree, that makes me a tree, right? Yeah. <laughs> no. But, but what, if, what, if I, what if I dressed up like a tree and I went... And I moved like a tree. So that would make me a tree, right? Right. No. no. So if I look like a tree... And I act like a tree. That still doesn't make me a tree, does it? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, can you? Hey, hold this. Hold this. So you're doing a good job. So there's a story about a man. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. I'm gonna put that right there. But it would be silly for me to say if I look like a tree and I act like a tree. Then I become a tree. No more than if I was to if I was to sit in the garage all day, would that make me a car? No, wouldn't make me a car either. There was a man in the Bible, Jesus was talking to. He says, Jesus started on his way. A man ran up to him and fell to his knees. Says, Good teacher, he asked, What must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus says, Why do you call me good? There's no one good except God. And you know the good command. You know the Ten Commandments: don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't fall, tell lies, and honor your father and your mother. And Jesus, Jesus says, all, and, the, and, the, and the guy says, "Teacher, I've done all this. I'm a good guy." And Jesus says, "I tell you what. Just because you look like a Christian, and may act like a Christian, don't make you a Christian." Because he was a good guy. He did what he was supposed to do. He didn't do what he was supposed to do. He went to church all the time. And God, Jesus says, I really see you. You're covered up and you're hiding. And you're trying to blend in. But the reality is I know your heart. And your heart belongs to your money. And he says, I'll tell you what, sell everything you have and come follow. I love Jesus says, and he, lo he looked at the man and he loved him. He said, sell everything you have and then come follow me. And then you'll understand what it takes. So we may have some distractions. <laughs> but that's okay. It's okay. Jesus says, I need you to be careful with distractions. And I need you to listen to me. I need you to follow me wherever I go. And if we follow him, then we become his. So let's pray and ask God to help us with that. Dear Jesus, I love you so much. Jesus, help me follow you and help me listen to your word today. I love you, Jesus, in your name. Everybody said, say amen. 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 I think he was going to pray with Annie. That was sweet, wasn't it? Amen. 
Today we're going to talk about the ascension of Jesus Christ. And um, have you ever heard of Ascension Day? It's a day on the calendar. It marks the 40th day that Jesus had risen from the dead, the day that he left earth and went to heaven. And uh, obviously it's going to vary from year to year because Easter varies from year to year. But this year, Ascension Day will be observed on May 26th, just The more you know, thought I'd share that with you. Now, the ascension of Jesus Christ helps us to understand more fully what he's done for us and what he's given us, and that's ultimately why I want to talk about it today. Uh, I love what Steve Matthewson said. He said, the ascension is a vital part of the redemption story. If we simply collapse the ascension into the resurrection, we miss stunning benefits tied directly to Jesus being taken into heaven. Um, Randy Alcorn, he loves to write about uh, heaven and uh, new heaven and the new earth. He's got a a great uh, ministry, I think, eternal perspective ministries or something along those lines. Uh, Randy Alcorn says this. He says, the ascension creates a paradigm shift. And I agree with that. Paradigm shift is just a technical way of saying we're looking at something familiar with a fresh understanding of how things are suddenly different. Now, think about uh, the ascension of Jesus. If he had not ascended to heaven, he'd still be walking around on earth today, wouldn't he? Because he he rose from the dead, so he lives forevermore. If he didn't ascend to heaven, he'd still be walking around earth today. And if we w- were to talk to someone about trusting Jesus, would you say, go talk to him? You know, Zoom him, text him, call him, do something, right? And it'd be hard for us to, to get anybody to do anything because we'd all say, well, just, just ask Jesus, he'll do it. But he did something that makes us, in my opinion, trust him even more. And that, he's, that is, he says, I'm going to heaven. I will be back. But I've got to go so that I can send the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will be in you and with you forever. And now when he tells us to do something, because he's not physically present, because he's in heaven, he's spiritually with us and he includes us in his work and we're physically doing it, but we have to fully depend on him to get it done. And I think that requires a lot of faith and a lot of trust. But the ascension creates a paradigm shift, and here's why. Um, Randy Alcorn says this. He says, Jesus could have dissolved, or he could have disappeared. Uh, And that's true. Remember uh, when he was walking with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, the two men that he met on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24, and they didn't recognize who he was, and they have this conversation about all the things that have happened, and he begins to show them what the Scripture says from the the, the law and the prophets and the Psalms uh, about himself. And then they sit down and when he breaks bread, their eyes are open and they realize it's him. And then he just disappears. Where'd he go? Okay. He, he could have done that. He could have dissolved. He could have disappeared. But instead, he physically ascended to a place from which he will physically return to earth in the same physical body. Randy Alcorn goes on to say, so Jesus became a man. That's the first coming, the incarnation. Um, He defeated death and assumed his eternal body as a man. That's the resurrection. He went back to heaven as a man. That's the ascension. And he will return as a man. That's the second coming. He will reign over the new earth as the God-man. And he has become a permanent member of the human race because he's God and he's man. And the more I thought about that, I'm like, that's just profound to think about. I think sometimes people just think that, you know, Jesus came into existence when he was born as a baby in Bethlehem, and then he went back to heaven, and he's just like some spirit being or something. No, he's got a physical body, and the same body that he had when he came, uh, that same body rose again, that same body ascended to heaven, and that same body Uh, Jesus is coming back someday. Let me show you how profound this is. We know John 3.16, but what about 1 Timothy 3.16? 1 Timothy 3.16 says, And most certainly the mystery of godliness is great. 
And then it says he, referring to Jesus, was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. The part that I want to talk to you about today is those four words, taken up in glory. That's the ascension of Jesus Christ. That's the moment that he left this earth to go back to the Father in heaven. There are two out of the four Gospels that uh, record this event. It's very brief. We're going to look at them quickly. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verse 50 and 51, uh, Luke says this, Then he, referring to Jesus, led them out to to the vicinity of Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was carried up into heaven. That's what Luke, the doctor, the physician says. What about Mark? In Mark's gospel, chapter 16, verse 19, his is even more brief. He says, so the Lord Jesus, after speaking to them, was taken up into heaven, and I love this part, and sat down at the right hand of God. And you might go, well, how did he know that? He didn't see that. I believe Jesus told them that. It says, so the Lord Jesus, after speaking to them, he was talking to them about different things. He had had appeared to them over a period of 40 days after, you know, being risen from the dead. And so I'm sure that he clued them in on some things that we don't have recorded. And so Mark's gospel says that not only was he taken up into heaven, but he sat down at the right hand of God. Now, there's a really good uh, Christian theology book out there. It's about all this thick, written by Millard Erickson. And he says this, Jesus sitting at the right hand of God should not be interpreted as a matter of rest or inactivity. It's a symbol of authority and active rule. And that's true. Jesus is now seated at the right hand of the Father, okay? And and he's now in a place of, uh, of authority, And he is actively ruling. He is waiting for all of his enemies to be a footstool for his feet. And that time is coming. So here's the big question that we're going to answer today. Why is the ascension of Jesus Christ important? Well, it's so important I'm going to give you a few answers, okay? The first one is we recognize his authority. Now think about that for a moment. Jesus rises from the dead we realize that he's got authority over death, right? I mean, he was, he was falsely accused. He, he was treated like a criminal. He, he was beaten and spit on and mocked and all these things. He was executed on a cross, the death penalty. He hung on a cross, a humili- humiliating way to die between two thieves. And they, you know, they, when they checked to see if he was dead, he was already dead, unlike the other two men. And they put him in a tomb. They even guarded it. They, they sealed it with a stone. And then on the third day, he rose again. And the fact that he rose from the grave, he appeared to his followers. He appeared to over 500 people at one time. Um, you know, just that alone is enough to take your breath away. But then to top even that and say, hey, watch this. I've got to go back to heaven. And they see him leave in the clouds. Uh, clearly his ascension accomplishes some things just as much as his resurrection did. It shows us that we recognize his authority. If he, if he had never ascended heaven, he'd still be walking around today and we're like, man, Jesus, you had the best day ever, right? Like you died and then you came back. We're, we're glad you're here. I wonder what God's thinking. But see, he's with the Father, okay? And so... Uh, look at Matthew 16 again, or, or Mark 16 again. So the Lord Jesus, after speaking to them, was taken up into heaven, and he sat down at the right hand of God. Why is that important? Well, it's so important that it's articulated to the Jewish believers in the New Testament. In the book of Hebrews, at the very beginning of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, it says, in these last days... God has spoken to us by his son. God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. 
the Son, that is Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word after making purification for sins, which is what he accomplished when he died on the cross and rose from the dead. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Wow. If you're familiar with the book of Hebrews, you will know that Jesus is called a priest. Not only a priest, he's called the high priest. And we are told that just like the high priest on the Day of Atonement, one day out of the year, was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies, the innermost court of the temple, which is where the the presence of God dwelt. Um, He couldn't go there except on that one special day, once a year. And even then, he had to take blood. Remember, we sang about that last week, without the shedding of blood, right? There's no forgiveness of sin. He would have to take blood shed from an animal first for his own sins, because he's just a man, the high priest was, and then for the sins of the people. But Jesus was tempted just like we were. He never sinned. And so now he's coming because he is the sacrifice, okay? And uh, look at what it says about that, that he sat down at the right hand of God. If you study the Old Testament temple, you'll see all the things that the priest did. But what you'll find is the priest never sat down. You know why the priest never sat down? Because their work was never done. But here in the New Testament, Jesus gave his life the ultimate sacrifice. Remember John the Baptist when he saw Jesus coming? He said, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Jesus came and he died. He shed his blood. He is the sacrifice for our sins. And now he's going to heaven to enter the true temple. You know, the the temple uh, blueprints that God gave Moses that were designed, and and we see it in the Old Testament, and then, you know, it it went from a tabernacle that was portable to in Solomon's day, it became a permanent structure, and it was a temple. Those blueprints were based on the heavenly temple. And so Jesus goes to heaven to go to the heavenly temple, and he enters it once and for all, giving the best sacrifice ever himself, the stainless, spotless, sinless Lamb of God sheds his own blood for your sin and for me and then he sits down at the right hand of the Father. Why? Because he said it's finished. The work is done. The price has been paid. Everything that's needed for you and me to be saved, he's done it and he sits down. Man, isn't that good? And not just to sit down. Boy, I, boy, I'd want to sit down after working hard, you know, and go, man, look at what I did. But he goes to heaven and sits down at the right hand of the Father. How's that for sitting down? And so he does that. So we recognize his authority. A second thing of why the ascension of Christ is important is we have the Holy Spirit. I'm reminded of what Jesus himself said in John 14, verse 16. He says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him. But you do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. And then in John 16, verse 7, again, he says, I'm telling you the truth. It's for your benefit that I go away because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. And if I go, I will send him to you. You know, again, if Jesus had not ascended to heaven, he'd still be walking around today. And we'd be a bunch of good for nothings. You know, we'd be talking about how Jesus needs to do something and we'd be calling him up. Hey, Jesus, get over here. We need your help, you know. And everybody would stand back and let Jesus do his thing. But now he tells us to trust him. He includes us in his work. He calls us the body of Christ. We're his hands. We're his feet. And he's doing the work in us and through us. And we're actually doing it, but we're depending on him to work in us and through us. And that takes trust. That takes faith. But oh, what grace that is that he would include us like that. Luke 24, verse 46 
says, he also said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And look, I am sending you what my father promised. As for you, stay in the city until you are empowered from on high. So not only did this promise of the Holy Spirit come from Jesus, it came from the Father. It came from God. And so Jesus says, I've got to go so that I can send another. And that another is the Holy Spirit. So think about it. If Jesus had never ascended to heaven, we would never have the Holy Spirit. We'd just be constantly looking for Jesus because he was still physically here. A third reason why the ascension of Jesus is important is we have access to the throne of God. Oh, I love this one. Go back to Hebrews 1 verse 3 again. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of His nature, sustaining all things by His powerful word. After making purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews goes on and elaborates on this theme in Hebrews 4, 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, what does that remind you of? Passing through the heavens, he ascended. That's ascension language, okay? Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. I remember years ago when I was in college, there was an ensemble called Truth, and they sang the song, I've got friends in high places. I don't know if this was before or after that other Garth song, but anyway, got friends in high places, okay? And uh, we do. We have Jesus, the Son of God, who is seated at the right hand of the Father. And now because he has not only died for me and rose from the dead and ascended to heaven, I now have access to the throne of God because Jesus is right there. That is awesome. Why is the ascension of Jesus important? We recognize his authority. We have the Holy Spirit. We have access to the throne of God. And number four, we have an advocate with the Father. Oh, I love this one. You know, John, who was very close to Jesus, in his epistle, 1 John chapter 2, John writes something. He says, my children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. Jesus' sacrificial death is enough to save anybody. It's enough to save everybody, okay? And here he's saying, look, he says, I don't want you to sin, but if you do sin, we have an advocate with the father now i don't have time to go in depth on this but whenever i read this verse i always think of uh, i believe it's uh, i can't remember if it's zechariah or zephaniah but one of those minor prophets that starts with a z it's one of them i think it's zechariah could be wrong and uh, zechariah uh, paints a picture in, in the old testament prophecies where the high priest at the time i think it's like a vision or something the high priest is standing before god and his throne And all of a sudden, there's the devil. There's the accuser of the brethren, which is what the Bible says. There's different titles or names for the devil in the Bible. He's Satan. He's the devil. He's the serpent. He's the father of all lives. He's a thief, okay? He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But also, he's the accuser of the brethren. He's the great deceiver. And so, here is the high priest, and he's wearing something that shows that it's not his best. He's not clean, and he's standing before God, and he, it looks like a, a, a bad situation. You know, he, 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 you're seeing his, 
his, his nature, how he's just a man and how he's weak and he's frail and he's sinful and he's defiled and he's unclean and the devil is there to jump on him. I mean, not just anybody, but a, a high priest and he's condemning, he's condemning this man before God, okay? And I, I see that picture sometimes when I read 1 John 2 that I don't want you to sin, but if you do sin, just know that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. What does that mean? That means when you and I struggle and stumble, when you and I sin as believers and the devil begins to whisper in our ear and he accuses us and he tells us how no good, awful we are and how God, God's not going to forgive us and how we're a loser and how he can't use us and on and on and on and on, we need to remember that we have an advocate with the Father. There is Jesus seated, seated at the right hand of the Father, okay? And he says, hey, hey, Dad, he says, that's one of mine. You see that, that child right there? He belongs to me. You see him? I died for him. I died for her. I shed my blood. That's, that's why I did that. It covers that. In other words, as our high priest, he's seated to remind us that the work is already done. The price has already been paid. Everything is finished and complete. And whenever the accuser comes to point the finger at us, he applies the healing balm of salvation and says, I've already covered that. I've already covered that. Isn't that good? Oh, man, that's good. I hope, I hope the Holy Spirit will help you grab that one this morning because that's my perhaps favorite truth about the ascension is now he is seated at the right hand of the Father and now he vouches for us. He's our advocate. He says, that's why I died. That's why I shed my blood. That is covered. I remember going to Promise Keepers years ago, and I wish I could remember his name now. I can see his face. He used to, he was a preacher, and he, uh, I'd see him on TV from time to time, and he, he got in front of all these thousands of men, and he whipped out a little handkerchief. And of course, back then, they had these big, you know, big microphones, Devin, you know, on the on the pulpit, I mean, it looked like a radio podcast mic or something, real big. And he just whipped out his handkerchief. He just dropped it on that microphone. He walked around. He said, everybody see that? Yeah. Do you know what that represents? No. And he looked at it. He peeked under the handkerchief, put it back. He looked at uh, the scriptures. He read something. He says, when Jesus died for my sins, it says, I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. And he looked at that handkerchief and he said, I'm covered. Isn't that right? I'm covered. And you and I need to realize that we are covered by the blood of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And now I have an advocate with the Father. And I love that. Amen. Well, let's look on. There's so much other good things here. Romans 5, verse 8. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, since we have now been declared righteous by his blood, will we be saved through him from wrath? And for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life stop. If we're saved by his death, and we are, how much more are we saved by his life? Because he rose again and he lives forevermore. Yes, we're saved by his death, but even more so by his life because he's not dead anymore. He's risen, he's raised, he's glorified, and he is ascended, exalted into the heavens, seated at the right hand of the Father. Why is the ascension of Jesus Christ important? We recognize his authority. We, 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 we have the Holy Spirit. We have access to the throne of God. We have an advocate with the Father. And here's another one. We have been given a spiritual gift. Now that one you might go, where'd that come from? Like, what does that even mean? What do you mean I've got a spiritual gift? That, like some of you might go, I don't even get that. I was trekking with you. But now I don't know what you're talking about. Well, I, I'm going to give you a couple passages. But first, let's go to the Old Testament for a minute because that's going to surprise you. Because in the Old Testament, there's a psalm about 
a, a king returning from victory. And in Psalm 68, verse 18, it says, You ascended to the heights, taking away captives. You received gifts from people. And Paul, the apostle Paul, is reading that passage. And when he writes to the church at Ephesus, he quotes it, and he says, that points to Jesus. That was actually fulfilled by Jesus. Look in Ephesians 4, 7. Now grace was given to each one of us according to the message of Christ's gift. For it says, when he ascended on high, he took the captives captive, and he gave gifts to people. But what does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower parts of the earth? The one who descended is the one who ascended far above all the heavens to fill all things. And he himself gave some to the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. So when Jesus ascended, remember he said, I've got to go so that I can send another, okay? And that is the Holy Spirit who is going to be with us and in us forever. Now extend that thought a little bit further. What does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit gives us power to be a witness for Christ. But what else does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit gives us a spiritual gift to serve the Lord that builds up the body of Christ. That would not have happened if Jesus had not ascended. If Jesus had not ascended, he'd still be walking around today and we wouldn't even exert ourselves because who's going to compete with the physical presence of Jesus? Like, there he is, just let him do his thing. But now he is in heaven, but he's spiritually present with us and he says, now I want you to trust me to work in you and through you. That is incredible. Why is the ascension of Christ important? We recognize his authority. We have the Holy Spirit. We have access to the throne of God. We have an advocate with the Father. We've been given a spiritual gift. And now the, the last one, we anticipate his return. Acts 1, verse 11. After Jesus ascended, they're still looking up in the sky. I'm sure, I mean, nobody had ever seen it before, right? So I'm sure they were going, wow, did he just leave? Yeah, he did. And they're still taking it all in, looking up in the sky. And then there's a couple of angels. And they say, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? And before they can go, did you see that? They say, this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way that you saw him going into heaven. He's coming back in the clouds. Isn't that good? It's what the Bible says. He's coming back in the clouds. Jesus is coming back. The fact that he left, we know where he is, but he's coming back. And I don't know when. Jesus says no man knows the day or the hour, so I'm going to, you know, you, you and I would be wasting our time trying to predict it. No one knows but the Father, and that's what Jesus himself said. But I do know what Paul said. We're closer now than the day I first believed. And that's true. We're closer now than the day when we first believed. Someday, one day, Jesus is coming back. And that is awesome. I'm reminded of a great song by Casting Crowns. It's called Glorious Day. Verse 3 and the chorus of the song say this. One day the grave could conceal him no longer. One day the stone rolled away from the door. Then he arose over death he had conquered. Now is ascended my Lord evermore. Death could not hold him. The grave could not keep him from rising again. And then the chorus goes like this. Living he loved me. Dying he saved me. Rising, he justified, uh, excuse me, living, he loved me, dying, he saved me, Bury, buried, he carried my sins far away, rising, he justified freely forever, one day he's coming, oh, glorious day. Well, we know about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, 
And then we jump to, oh, he's coming back. But the only reason why we can say he's coming back is because he ascended. And we need to be reminded of what all he accomplished when he ascended into heaven, went before the throne of God, and sat down at the right hand of the Father. That, to me, is pretty awesome. So what does the ascension of Jesus mean to me? Unlike everything I just shared, I've got one, one last bullet in my gun here I want to share with you. What, what does it mean to me? It means that I'm accepted as God's child. When I go back and look at uh, the chorus of Glorious Day again, living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified me freely forever. And one day he's coming, oh glorious day. What does all that mean? If he loved me, if he saved me, if he carried my sins away, if he justified me and he's coming back, you know what that means? That I am fully accepted as God's child. Why? Because he's at the right hand of the Father. He's done everything that needs to be done for you and I to be saved. He did the work. He paid the price. He said, it's finished. The work is complete. It's done. And he's sit down at the right hand of the Father. And now we have access to the throne of God where we can come boldly uh, for grace and mercy in our time of need. Jesus has not only sat down at the right hand of the Father, he has sent another, a counselor, an advocate. He has sent us the Holy Spirit who is not just with us, but in us forever. That's what Jesus said. And not only that, not only is he at the right hand of the Father, not only has he sent the Holy Spirit to indwell us, but he says, I'm coming back the same way I left. We'll see him in the clouds. Revelation 1.8 says that every eye will see him. Oh, how I look forward to that day. I'll close with a, a quote by Dan DeWitt. He says, the life of Jesus is our God. And here's what he means by that. Jesus' incarnation shows us that he became like us became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus' resurrection shows that we will become like him. Just like he was raised, someday we will be raised. And then he says, and Jesus' ascension shows that where he is, we also will be. Woo! Mm, I like that, don't you? I will be with him wherever he is. That's where I'm going to be. And so today, I want to encourage you. Think about the ascension of Jesus Christ. He gave his life. He shed his blood. He did the work. He paid the price. He did everything that was necessary for you and me, anyone and everyone to be saved. He did it. He paid it all. And now he offers the the gift of eternal life to anyone who will turn from their life of sin and put their trust and follow Jesus. Won't you come today? We're so sure of this that not only did he rise from the dead, but after 40 days of appearing to different people at different times and explaining even more on the other side of the cross after the resurrection, he does, he does the ultimate. He says, I got to go. And he ascended to heaven. And now he sits at the right hand of the Father. It can't be more done than that. Let's all stand. Musicians, won't you come? This is your time to respond. I pray that God is speaking to you this morning. I pray that you will realize what all Jesus has done for you, okay? And you won't let another day go by without saying, oh, Lord Jesus, thank you. I know I'm a sinner. I know that if I stand before you on judgment day, that 
that it's, it's not going to be good. I'm going to be separated from you for all eternity. But now I realize, after hearing the word today, after thinking of the cross, after looking at the life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension of Jesus Christ, I now realize what he's done for me. And I don't want to live another day without him. I now want to say, oh, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Lord, forgive me. Save me. Take my life. I'm yours. I want to trust and follow you. I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I believe when he said it's finished, it's finished. When he said paid in full, he paid it all. And now I can come before the Father through the blood of Jesus. He's opened the door, y'all. He's opened the door for you and me and anyone else to be saved. Don't let another day pass by. Maybe God's speaking to you right now. If he's knocking on the door of your heart, you need to say, Lord Jesus, I want to give you my life. I want to trust and follow you. I believe you did that for me so that I could be saved. And I realize that that is enough. It's enough. It's enough. He sat down at the right hand of the Father. It's enough. When the devil, you know, let let me say this. I've talked to people before that unfortunately said, you know, I just didn't become a Christian. I don't think I'm interested in being a Christian. And I here's the thing. I appreciate when people are honest like that. I really do. You know, I, that's what it's all about, right? Let's be honest with each other. Let's talk about this. A lot of times I'll hear this, this excuse. They'll say, preacher, I just can't live that way. I, I, I just can't live that way. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tap out. I don't want to be a hypocrite. I just can't live that way. So that's where it's at. Let me say something about that. I can't live that way either. Now, some of you are going, well, my goodness, and he's a pastor. No, listen, I learned a long time ago, there's only one person that can live the Christian life. Just one. His name is Jesus Christ. Even Paul the Apostle, who said, you know, I was a Pharisee of a Pharisees. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. You know, when it comes to the law, I was faultless, like he had a great spiritual resume. But he said, I count it all as loss for Jesus. Matter of fact, he goes on to say to another church, he says, I am crucified with Christ, and yet I live. I live because of the one who loved me, who sought me and bought me. Think about that. I'm dead. I tried living life on my own. I tried to do it my way. I tried to save myself. You know what I found out? I can't do it. But then I realized Jesus, he did it for me. He did it for you. And now I realize all I got to do is trust him. And as far as living this great life, I have to live it one day at a time, trust in Jesus. And some of you go, well, that sounds pretty good, preacher, but I don't know if I'm convinced. (laughs) Let me tell you this. Jesus would agree. The Father would agree. The Bible would agree. You might say, I don't understand, preacher. Why do you think Jesus is at the right hand of the Father? And every time we sin, every time we stumble, and the devil says, see, look at him. He's a hypocrite. He's a phony. He ain't got it. That ain't real. And because we've trusted Jesus, he's at the right hand saying, Father, I got this. Father, he's come to me. He belongs to me now. Father, I paid the price for him. Father, this one's with me. He's my child. The Father would agree because the Father would know that If we just try to do it on our own, it ain't ever going to be good enough. And you know what? Here it comes. Are you ready? That's why he sent the Holy Spirit. Let that sink in for a minute. If you didn't need the Holy Spirit, if I didn't need the Holy Spirit, he would have never mentioned it. He would have never done it. But oh, We need the Holy Spirit. And the same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead 
that same spirit lives inside of every believer of Jesus Christ. No, I can't live this Christian life on my own. I'm not good enough to pull it off. But I recognized a long time ago that I was a sinner that needed a Savior. And I realized that what He did for me is enough. Not only did He cover my past, remember the preacher? I'm covered. Woo, I am covered. He covered my past by His blood. Now in my present experience, He's at the right hand of the Father saying, Dad, this one's with me. He's mine. My blood covers that. Covers all, all His sin. And then when I think about the future, He gave me the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is like a deposit. You ever bought a house? You got to have a big down payment, don't you? You ever bought a vehicle? Still need a down payment, just not as big, right? Well, the Bible uses that kind of language to describe the Holy Spirit. It says that the, the Holy Spirit is God's deposit guaranteeing our future. In other words, He gives us a little taste of heaven now. He says, now that Jesus is here and he's at the right hand of the Father, I'm now sending the Holy Spirit. And if you think that's glorious, you hadn't seen nothing yet. You think about that. You hadn't seen nothing yet. So today, we're fixing the scene. And I just want to encourage each and every one of you. If you've been putting off making a decision for Jesus Christ, if you've been putting off saying, well, I just don't want to be a hypocrite. Well, I, I just never could live up to that standard. I just couldn't do that. What more do you need? He paid it all. He did it all. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, and he gives you his Holy Spirit, and you trust and follow him one day at a time. And everybody sees God in your life. They know it ain't you. They know it ain't me. It's all him. Let's pray. Father, I come before you right now. I pray that you'd speak to each and every heart. And Father, I pray right now, today, this moment, if there's someone that needs to come and trust and follow you, Father, I pray that today would be that day. Lord, no more excuses. No more holding back. No more putting it off. Lord, maybe today is the day. And Lord, the Bible does declare today is the day of salvation. Lord, if, you, if we hear your voice, Lord, if you begin to move in our heart, Lord, today can be that day of salvation if we'll just come and trust and follow you. And Father, I pray for every believer right now, Lord, that we might be praying if there's someone here today, Lord, that they would take that step and say, yes, Jesus, I'm going to trust and follow you. Lord, have your will and your way in this service and in this invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all sing, y'all. On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross The emblem of suffering and shame And I love cherish the old rugged cross until my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange
Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown Amen Amen. It's, it's been good this morning, hasn't it? i tell you what, who says that we just do church on Easter? Every Sunday is Easter to me. Amen. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus uh, changes your life. And so I want to remind you again, don't forget, 5 o'clock right here tonight, we're going to ordain uh, Donnie and Darren, and uh, look forward to that. And I want to encourage you to be here for that. And then afterward, we'll do what all good Baptists do. I won't even say it. You know what it is, right? All right. Good deal. So uh, I want to encourage you to do that. All right. Anybody else? All right. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right. Um, you ever have one of those moments where you're like, who am I going to call on to play? pray? And then when I ask it, everybody drops their head. Hey, Gordon, would you dismiss us in prayer, brother?